Hello and welcome from the University of Notre Dame Press. I'm today's host and moderator, Stephen Little, and I'm so excited to be here today under the auspices of our new Books for Better Understanding author event series. And I'm really excited today because we have with us today's featured author, David Bentley Hart, whose Theological Territories was published by Notre Dame Press in April of this year. David's most recent appointment was at the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Studies. And uh, David, you dedicated your book to uh, our mutual friends, uh, John and Laura Betts. And I'm very glad to have uh, John with us here today, joining us as the interviewer. Uh, John's an associate of professor of theology at Notre Dame. And I'm just thrilled to be part of this conversation, theological conversation between uh, people, people that I consider uh, not only friends, but also two of the most influential theologians in America today. So I want to thank you very much for being here, for making time for this. And uh, with that, uh, I turn it over to you, John. Thank you, Stephen. It's really kind of you to have me uh, involved with this. And it's a pleasure to be able to interview David. Um, I've never interviewed my friend before, um, so this will be a first. Well, except when I applied to become a friend of his. He has a very strict application <laughs> process. <laughs> he did yeah. a background check. I mean, it, 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 it was thorough. It was thorough. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know how much territory we plan to cover here today, uh, Stephen. Um, as long as it's theological. As long as it's theological, all right, theological territory. Okay, very well. So I'd like to begin uh, properly with the first essay on tragedy, uh, which is essentially an elaborate response to Rowan Williams's book, The Theological Imagination. Um, it goes without saying that uh, uh, you've got great respect for uh, Rowan, David. But oh, yeah. it's also clear that you have considerable reservations about his views about tragedy and perhaps even more so about the views of D.M. McKinnon and Nicholas Lash. Um, that issue more specifically, I think, is the relationship here between Christianity and tragedy, and more specifically still, whether tragedy is able to capture what's going on in the gospel. So why don't we begin with this question, whether Christianity is really compatible with tragic theology, um, and whether it can be understood and fathomed in such terms. Um, or even more simply, is the good news a kind of tragic wisdom? Yeah, no, thank, uh, first of all, thanks for uh, arranging this, Stephen. Um, and uh, thanks, John, for, for, for agreeing uh, to grill me again, just as you did all those years ago. But, um, yeah, no, I, I not only have enormous respect for Rowan Williams, I'm not really, even in, in that essay, taking uh, issue with the points he wants to make about tragedy. I mean, for him, there are, if you, it's a very short book, uh, Rhodes, but I can't recall, recall the title, I'm afraid, because I'm bad with titles. Uh, and and there, it's full of, I, I think, some genuinely brilliant insights on the moral tutelage of tragedy, on, uh, on the way uh, a, a tragic vision uh, teaches us to temper our understanding of hope, or at least deep in it. But still, uh, you know, I, I do have my reservations and have done for, for some years. And it goes back to old arguments that I had with D.M. McKinnon and Nicholas Lash in my first book years ago, both of whom were anxious or, or thought it useful to use Attic tragedy as a way of reading the Gospels. My problem with this is not, as might be suspected uh, by some, not, not that, uh, that tragedy is too dark a vision of reality properly to capture all the dimensions of the gospel story. Uh, rather, my problem is that tragedy is too optimistic and they're uh, a, a, an art form and therefore too metaphysically optimistic an art form and therefore not radical enough in the sort of hope that it can propose or understand. Um, and these, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a fairly elaborate argument, so I, I, I don't imagine we can, we can reduce it here to a few simple propositions. Uh, but what I mean by what I say is one of the, the points that, that D.M. McKinnon and Nicholas Lash, and by the way, let me point out, Nicholas Lash passed away this year, he was one of my early teachers, uh, a man of considerable brilliance. So again, 
these uh, these arguments are not uh, rejections of the of, of the of the perspective they represent, uh, McKinnon or Lash, but simply qualifications of a fairly <laughs> vigorous sort. Um, for them, it was necessary uh, to remind Christians that 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 the gospel is not about a, a kind of easy hope in which there's simply a happy ending to a story that reverses everything that had gone before. That rather the actual passage through the tragedy of estrangement and, and death and even the loss of God is in some sense retained within the logic of the kingdom. Is in, in a sense, the wounds of Christ are always apparent in the body of the resurrection. And you know, the, 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 they simply thought that a tragic vision helped guard against too facile a hope, and put and and to put aside what McKinnon and Lash both call metaphysical comfort. The problem with this is, I thought that it was it was a it was an inept reading of Attic tragedy to begin with. That a uh, Attic tragedy is not is itself already a form of metaphysical consolation. It uh, was something performed, written for, performed within the the civic festival, the public, the religious festival of the Dionysia. It was a way of both celebrating and propitiating the dangerous divine force of frenzy that Dionysus, or rather Dionysus, if you prefer, had brought into Greek culture at some immemorial point in the past. And as such, the structure of tragedy. Uh, so I argue at least again and again, is an argument that says that uh, despite the loss of uh, the hero or the protagonist or the grand and glorious figure who occupies the center of the drama, the protagonist, despite the pain suffered, nonetheless, there is a kind of divine refuge to be sought within the, within the confines of the city. And in the city, there's a reconciliation. And, he, and this is one of my problems with Roe Williams' book, is that he, he doesn't take the young Nietzsche seriously enough. He, he doesn't mention Nietzsche once in the book. And I think Nietzsche was on to something just, just almost objectively true about Attic religious culture, is that in, in the celebration of the Dionysian and in the tragic dance, and then later the tragic drama, there's a kind of reconciliation being affected between the Apolline notion of order, um, serene proportion, uh, authority, and the violence of the orgy. And what the ultimate moral meaning of tragedy is, even if it's not some sort of explicit message spelled out here or there in every single drama, is ultimately that the loss to which we reconcile ourselves is irrecuperable, but that loss can point us back towards the religious, political, and and social shelter of the city and its order, its hierarchy of authority. And that's the consolation that tragedy offers, is that it exhausts the grief, the rage, the frenzy, uh, that the, 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 uh, nature and, and the suffering of history produces and then allows us to reconcile ourselves to the lesser, seemingly lesser violences of the city and submit ourselves to its rule. My claim is that the Christian story is far more subversive than this, that it rejects precisely that tragic wisdom, that, that though indeed, you know, the wounds of Christ remain in the resurrection body. Tragedy makes a much more, out, I mean, Christian, the gospel makes a much more outlandish claim, which is that, no, we should not reconcile ourselves to the loss of the particular, that actually that is still slavery to death and the powers. And that, in fact, we, we all of our hope now hangs on the impossible mad expectation that the one who is lost will be returned again in his or her particularity. And, the, and in, in this way, the Christian gospel 
creates a greater dilemma than tragedy because there's no metaphysical consolation now available, no, no serene tragic wisdom that can teach us that, oh yes, life, you know, life is a, is a negotiation between death and life, between darkness and light. We no longer have that available to us as a retreat. We now are asked to, po to, to venture all our hope on the impossible promise of the kingdom. And that, in fact, the tragic wisdom, and you can read the Gospels as a tragedy, except that then, of course, they end incorrectly. God reverses the verdict. The tragedy is undone in some very real sense. Uh, McKinnon and Lash can protest at putting it that way. But nonetheless, it's true. Uh, you know, I am the one who was dead and now I'm alive. And, you know, and that's simply... Uh, the reality that, that 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 Christianity demands that the faithful either commit themselves to or turn away from as an impossible hope, but the tragic wisdom is no longer available from the perspective of Christian consciousness. Anyway, I'm trying. I'm taking great a very long time to oversimplify the argument, so I'll stop there. But but those those are the basic terms of of the debate. Sure. Um, David, we might run out of time if I take these essays in the order of their appearance in the volume. Um, I mean, we might not end up covering much theological territory as the book intends, but uh, let's turn now to the second essay, remarks made to Jean-Luc Marion regarding his little book uh, entitled Revelation and Given Us. I think we share the view you expressed there, but I'm not quite sure that I would express it uh, with as much flair. Uh, I'm quite sure that I wouldn't. Um, beginning with the opening sentence, you say, it may be that the most crucial task incumbent upon theology today is that of finally overcoming the overcoming of metaphysics. Could you elaborate on that claim? And could you perhaps say something about the future of phenomenology without metaphysics? I mean, if we, one follows Marion, then phenomenology, not metaphysics, would seem to be the new first philosophy. But where does this leave us? Um, uh, and it, 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 leaves us, it, it leaves us absolutely nowhere. The problem is phenomenology uh, can be first phenomenal, can be a first philosophy only uh, to the degree that it presumes its own downfall. That is, it understands itself as an attempt to if it, so long as it understands itself as as an attempt to find the limits of its own discourse and uh, find the point at which it requires a metaphysical supplement to so to speak almost invert it uh it leads absolutely nowhere it's simply uh it's simply uh, a game and it's also one that's internally incoherent um for generations, arguably for centuries now, uh, Christians uh, have, been, have been told by various figures, Luther, for instance, <laughs> that philosophy is a harlot uh, or that uh, metaphysics has corrupted the pure wellsprings of theology. To my mind, theology without metaphysics is, as I say elsewhere in the book, analogous to air without atmosphere. It, it simply has no shape. Every statement about reality, every statement of truth comes already uh, with implicit theological commitments, with implicit metaphysical commitments written into them and not to seek out what those commitments are, not to clarify them, not to seek to understand them, is simply to abdicate the work of thinking theologically. In the case of, of Marion's phenomenology, though, it comes at the end of a very specific uh, modern continental tradition, a sort of Heideggerian and post-Heideggerian imperative uh, to set aside metaphysical claims as belonging to uh, a kind of a hierarchy of essences which attempts to capture uh, the mystery of being in stable, deadening concepts. And, and so this is the, uh, of course, as it were, left-wing 
political supplement to that become a structure of oppression whereby uh, those in supposedly in possession of these principles can can arrange not only the hierarchy of values and and philosophical commitments but of social order and and you know make distinctions among persons it's it, it becomes a kind of hysteria actually with a, a lot of philosophers uh, claiming that the moment you make uh, say a, a philosophical claim about act and potency that you're two steps away from colonialism or uh, enslavement i mean it's it's a ridiculous set of connections and one that we 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 should just ignore as indulgently as possible in the case of mario supposedly phenomenology getting past metaphysics means getting past also the reign of the subject so he's thinking of metaphysics very specifically in a 17th 18th century sense get and and the power of the subject to compose reality and therefore by the possession of certain principles determine how being can reveal itself or how anything can reveal itself even god again uh i i find this uh more hysteria than anything else but the way he shores it up is by is by uh speaking of a a a givenness in the phenomena that exceeds uh, the intention of the subject and overwhelms it and saturates intentionality. And he doesn't seem to realize that all this is is simply to reaffirm the priority of the subject from the opposite direction. And it doesn't make phenomenology reveal anything. It, it, it brings up the question of why we would even engage in the practice. Any phenomenology of any value, if it's, if we're not just talking about in, you know, sort of the scientific sense of a phenomenology that tries to reconstruct an event from its most basic uh, manifestations, but we're talking about a phenomenology that pretends to have some sort of solvent philosophical purpose. Any phenomenology is one uh, of any value is one that seeks its own overthrow. It seeks to find that point at which what it, it, it can identify as manifest requires a metaphysical explanation. And at that point allows itself to be inverted so that the order of knowing, the ordo cognoscendi discovers itself to be the same as continuous with, but from a different, from the opposite angle as the ordo ascendi, the order of being. And, uh, Frankly, uh, I, I think phenomenology has the resources within itself to recognize that it is itself only an approach to metaphysics. If it's not an approach to metaphysics, it's simply the practice of a kind of rhapsodic glossolalia, you know, just constantly speaking, constantly describing, and uh, never affirming anything. Mario's understanding of givenness in Revelation is so peculiar precisely because if you follow its logic, nothing can possibly be revealed except that which exceeds intentionality. The problem is that which exceeds intentionality as such, if that's all it does, cannot be revealed. You know, you, you, you trap yourself in this strange circle in which you simply piously uh, withdrawal from from making positive statements of of a metaphysical kind, and keep pointing to the event of disclosure as though it's just an absolute enigma of of overwhelming otherness. Uh, I think metaphysics, properly understood, once we get away from the caricatures, metaphysics is simply that which reason discovers to be the inevitable conclusion, conclusions that follow from recognizing the limits of, of physical uh, or empirical knowledge, but that are clearly implied in the very liaison between knowledge and being. Metaphysics is inevitable and in theology, it's absolutely necessary because theology, you know, at least 
understands itself to be a discourse of truth about the nature of things, about the nature of God, the nature of creation, the nature of the self, and to have disclosed these things in a history, but also a history that points towards a certain inevitable set of logical deductions. Um, I think the whole notion of taking metaphysics out of theology is one that has to be abandoned as one of the great follies of modern thought. And the notion that phenomenology could be a first philosophy in any but a propideutic sense has to be abandoned as self-evidently um, inadequate, self-evidently a failure. And we might say that um, Edith Stein and Hedwig Conrad Martius, who were closest to Husserl um, and to his school, were, the, were the, the, those who precisely charted that path from phenomenology to metaphysics. And it's rather striking that we haven't picked up on that fact and have instead yeah. chosen to follow the disciples of Heidegger. Yeah, yeah we, we followed a, a different in which phenomenology uh, vaguely allied to something called ontology, uh, uh, you know, a, a questionable designation at that, in which phenomenology becomes an alternative to metaphysics rather than a way of trying, so to speak, correct the course mm -hmm. of metaphysical thinking. Well, on that note, maybe we should move on uh, and try to cover some more uh, terrain. Um, and uh, this might take us then naturally to uh, the third chapter um, on postmodern theology. Um, it's too amusing, really, to pass over. Um, and I dare say it was the most entertaining of all the papers given at the NDIAS conference you hosted a few years ago. So it definitely got the most laughs, <laughs> if I can say that. But that so, might have been just because of the clothes I was wearing. So, <laughs> so, so could you perhaps say a few words about uh, postmodern theology as represented, say, by Richard Carney or John Caputo? Well, or, I mean, once again, I mean, we don't have to go over again the, the whole issue of, of getting past metaphysics. I think what I was trying to point out in that talk uh, was that every claim to have arrived at the end of the philosophical narrative, the, the metaphysical narrative, is implicitly a claim to have concluded all other narratives. One of the things I find most peculiar uh, in a lot of the so-called postmodern discourse I was talking about uh, is that it claims that it wants to be, put aside all meta narratives, except that, of course, it's the greatest meta narrative of all. I mean, it, 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 it outstrips Hegel in the range of its philosophical pretensions, and that it claims to have reached the genuine end of the philosophical story and discovered the, 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 that the entire metaphysical enterprise was itself only an episode uh, that, that, that has to be put aside. And then uh, to call this hospitality to others. But of course, it's hospitality of, of a remarkably imperious kind. The same person who frets that, that an adherence to the Western canon of metaphysical thought uh, is, is, is an invitation to try to impose that on another culture and that may, you know, in a way that makes dialogue impossible. It makes it impossible to learn from other cultures. That very same person is proposing uh, a, a, a hard and fast uh, demarcation between metaphysical reasoning and, and what religious and philosophical discourse should be. Let me give you an example. Try to get, enter into, into a serious dialogue with Hindu thought. Say, Vishishta Advaita Vedanta. Okay. Uh, if you start by saying, well, I, I want to start in a non-metaphysical place because we've discovered that all metaphysics are mostly are just cultural semiotic systems that in themselves are dispensable and if adhered to in any but a, uh, but a critical sense are, are simply structures of oppression, uh, you're never actually going to be entering into dialogue with anyone because, uh, because there's no such thing as non-metaphysical Vedanta. But moreover, you have just told your interlocutor, that he has to subject his entire system of belief, his entire tradition of thinking, to the Western 
uh, modernity that says that all such thinking is itself merely a symbolic economy that can be uh, transcended uh, under the form of an unknowing hospitality to the other. This is metaphysical ambition at its highest peak, if, at its highest pitch, if you understand metaphysical uh, ambition to be a kind of colonialism. It's nothing other than the worst possible attempt to impose a, a final and, uh, and uh, ultimately non-negotiable Western narrative on other traditions. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, and that's what I find most curious about it, is, is that uh, we're supposedly tossing aside the fetters of metaphysics uh, when in fact all we're really doing is taking the kind of supposedly meta narrative ambition that Hegel brought to so you know that Hegel attempted or that Heidegger in a different sense right, to an altogether more pernicious uh, and and doctrinaire form of of, of metaphysical finality. Um, well, we might take that as an opportunity to discuss uh, part four of the book as well. And uh, on that, I mean the relationship between Christianity and world religions um, that is covered yeah. you know, through these various vignettes of various figures. I mean, um, Empson and um, uh, Segalen and, um, uh, uh, and so forth. So maybe you could comment on, on that part of the book, um, how you see the relationship between Christian and other religions and and whether Christianity uh, can be complete without assimilating in some ways what they know. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think of, try not to think in terms of religions at all, I have to be honest, but um, because what do we mean when we say the Christian religion? What we mean is an ensemble of traditions and we draw the boundaries around those traditions as our temperaments dictate. So, you know, well, all right, so Orthodox Catholic, let's get the Anglicans in. Okay, they, I guess you have to accept Reformed theology, but not Jehovah's Witness, or yes, Jehovah's Witness. Or not. You know, there is no single Christian religion, right? There are traditions which more or less, we presume, testify to the event of Christ in time, but also the reality of the Logos as the ground of all creation. Well, it's quite possible, wouldn't you think, that the same can be said then of all so-called religious traditions, even if they only, even if they can't thematize that specifically in Christian terms. So a metaphysical system like, well, let's say Advaita Vedanta or Vishishta Advaita Vedanta or um, Chittamatra Buddhism, or it may in many ways just as Neoplatonism did for you know the, the church fathers, contain uh, perspectives on the reality that's made manifest to Christian by uh, Christian consciousness in the event of Christ and the theology that that, that attaches there too, that are far better, far more illuminating than uh, than the traditions that we recognize as part of the kindred. Uh, traditions of Christianity. I don't think uh, a, a Christianity that that seals itself off against uh, you know the religious revelations, and I would say revelations of humanity, especially not one that 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 chooses to cling to a particular school of thought within Christian tradition as the one true expression of what is, after all, an inexhaustible mystery, is ever anything other than an impoverished caricature of what true Christian thought could be. Now, part of this, of course, that my early education, I did a lot of study of Asian religions, and I come from religious studies originally, not from theology, and I still prefer to think of myself in those terms, is I'm simply just too poignantly aware of the many areas from which Christian thinkers, ways in which Christian thinkers could learn from these other traditions. And I don't just mean the metaphysical and the philosophical traditions, but also certain devotional certain mystical practices, certain contemplative ones that are analogous to, but in other ways subtly different from those native 
to Christian tradition. Uh, and I think that we are at a, we really are, it, it can't, you know, have gone unnoticed by God, so to speak, <laughs> that we are in a global age, that, that we can't, we can't pretend that the prejudices that we, that we used to live by regarding other faiths and other creeds correspond to the realities. There have been attempts to do that. I mean, right up well into the 20th century, I mean, pick up G.K. Chesterton talking about Buddhism or Hinduism, and you should wince in pain at the sheer stupidity of the things he says, because he just assumes that it's not Catholicism, it's not Christianity, therefore it's obviously wrong. And, and he knows what it's wrong about and how it's wrong. And everything he says is utterly cretinous. But that's the way we were, you know, the one time, you know, Christians thought that to affirm faith in Christ meant to affirm uh, simultaneously that, of course, all Buddhists are morons who hate the world. You know, it's, it's it, I hope we've grown <laughs> past that realize. But the bigger point I'm making is I don't even think of the Christian religion as a true religion over against other religions. I think the very notion of a religion as such is an inadequate way of trying to limit the scope, the possible scope of the radiance of revelation. Christianity testifies in a variety of ways to what it, what it has seen, what it has touched. But that same reality in other ways, even the historical reality of the incarnation, perhaps, has been seen and touched in different forms by other faiths that would not even know, would have even before, you know, would, would, you know even without any contact uh, with the Christian tradition. And that we have to have a much more expansive understanding of revelation and even Christian revelation if, if we're, if uh, then it's at times we're in the habit of, of allowing ourselves to have. Um, on that note, maybe we could backtrack a little bit um, to part um, two um, and go back into the borderlands of theology and science, if you're prepared to talk about that. And I think that's a, a major feature of this book. Um, um, I mean, ever since the legendary Galileo affair, uh, we've been wont to, um, to conceive of science and theology in terms of opposition, uh, not to say outright antagonism, or uh, so it seems uh, a lot of scientists tend to think of the matter. Um, of course, you know what they think of as theology may be more like a species of mythology, and I think you bring that out. Or, or deism, it's one or the other. It's one or the other. Yeah. Or deism, yeah. Um, but leaving that aside, I mean, I'm going to chapter, chapter eight directly. I mean, how ought one to go about this topic today, um, to echo the title of this chapter, where, where does the consonance between science and theology really lie, as you say? Well, I mean, it, yeah, the con I'm trying to remember that essay. I think there, of course, that's actually in many ways a very sort of a, um, ironic piece. I, I'm not so much interested in a more uh, in the the polemic that you get from people like uh, uh, Dawkins and others who have, you know, let's be honest, an, an infantile notion of of what theistic thought is, but also in a sense an infantile notion of what science is. I mean, at least a credulous one, because the sciences in the modern world tend to come. Uh, with an implicit metaphysics that isn't recognized as a metaphysics. And so those who are enthralled to it are unaware of it. But you know, we made a decision in the West as a culture in the 17th century that the best approach to a scientific understanding of nature was first on the analogy of a mechanism and second by a process of inductive reasoning which refuses to presume any form of causality other than an exchange of energy between objects and motion, right? And with it came a kind of uh, cr crude caricature of the, th the, the thinking of previous ages. I mean, Aristotelianism was just reduced to its physical claims and its understanding of causality was misconstrued as a claim about four different kinds of causal force acting upon uh, an otherwise inert object. 
and the result of this has been that, that, that all sorts of paradoxes have arisen and all sorts of conflicts that are not only not necessary, but that ultimately lead only towards irresolvable problems, uh, conceptual problems. Now, we live in a post-mechanistic age in any number of ways, but the metaphysics that reigns supreme in much of the sciences hasn't changed since the 17th century, which is a curious thing. Uh, you know, for instance, um, you know, take, take, take the failure of molecular biology fully to explain to us the, the nature of, of the phenotypes that, that are produced by a genome, if you want to put it that way. And the attempt to get past this by, by certain new ways of thinking about, about biology, um, you know, systems biology, for instance, ones that put a greater uh, emphasis upon epigenetic forces, movements in convergent evolution, all of them are trying to find their way back to a way of thinking of, say, an organism as a set of rational relations that intrinsically has a kind of finality, not, ne not necessarily one imposed by a designer, but nonetheless, uh, a kind of finality that explains the formal determinations of the organism in a way that makes better sense of the exquisite uh, complexity and, and unity, and, and in a sense, self-creating unity of an organism. Well, in many ways, this is almost like an accidental rediscovery of, of the Aristotelian notion that everything exists in, in, as a set of rational relations that we're in the habit of translating as causes, but I mean, better understood as rationales. Already in, in biology, there's a movement away from sheer mechanism because it's not, in, just because of its own explanatory insufficiency or in the wet realm of quantum mechanics, you know, how many of the, the enigmas of the measurement problem and others are generated by an unwillingness uh, by, uh, on the part of many, even in the realm of, of, of quantum effects that don't fit into a mechanistic paradigm, our, our unwillingness to think uh, in, in any sense uh, of, of uh, in any way that doesn't uh, insist that larger scale reality has to emerge from as the consequence solely of lower scale phenomena, even though there doesn't seem to be any way of moving uh, from the quantum to the macroscopic realm uh, uh, with ease, so to speak, uh, that explains the same uh, it explains the very paradoxes that we've known of about for more than a century. Um, the conflicts that, that, are, that, that people perceive as, as existing uh, between the realm of the sciences and, and the realm of religious thought are almost invariably the result of this residual metaphysics of mechanism, which, which persists despite in the failure of a purely mechanistic uh, paradigm to explain reality either uh, in living systems or at, uh, you know, as, as, as at the level of quantum effects. Uh, I don't remember the question now. I've gone off on a tangent, haven't I? Uh, we were talking simply about the relationship between theology and science, but that was all. Well, I mean, I, just, I, don't, I don't know. It's if a fascinating tangent, though. I mean, I loved it. I don't know if there has to be a relation as such, as long as one understands that that um, that Thomas Aquinas was right. That uh, these are different modalities of discourse, talking about being under different modal designations. You can have uh, ends qua natura. <laughs> you know. um, it, 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 it's uh, a, a, a natural philosophy, for instance, uh, can talk about the structure of reality in a way that ultimately might lead it towards a supreme principle. 
whereas theology might talk about what it understands to have been revealed in creation and in history in a way that leads to a supreme principle. What of those modes of discourse will identify that as the one God actuality, thought thinking itself perhaps, who knows? The other will identify that ultimate principle as the God and Father of Christ, you know, right? As long as it's understood that what's going on here is not that uh, there's a conflict describing a single object or uh, two different discourses that are speaking of two completely discontinuous realms of concern, but rather two different modalities of approaching the, the, the mystery of being, which are inherently coherent, I mean, intrinsically coherent, but then also in no way come into conflict with one another and in fact supplement and illuminate one another. Uh, uh, you know, that the, 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 the everything else, the, uh, the notion that, that these are two ways of approaching the same problems on the same level of discourse, that what a Christian theologian means by creation and what a physicist might mean when talking about quantum fluctuations within the quantum foam, perhaps being the origin of the universe, are not two opposed stories about the same supposed event. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything more to be said about that. I don't, I don't think that scientists should seek theological imprimaturs for their work. And I certainly don't think uh, theologians should should take seriously the claims that the sciences could prove or disprove something about the doctrine of creation. Uh, but in that very, in, in placing those limits upon what each discourse can do, each discourse also learns something about itself. <laughs>